Amen. Church family, what do you say? Amen. What do you say again? Amen. The Lord is good all and all the time. God is great. Amen. Um, once again, I'd like to welcome you to uh, this session that we have today. Welcome you to our Sabbath worship. I want to thank you for coming to worship with us. You could have been anywhere else to come to Maranatha, and we are grateful to God because of you. Uh, how many of you together with me appreciate the work our sister Mora is doing? Amen, amen. So, Sister Mora, thank you so much. God bless you. We need that information. Uh, we are perishing because of lack of knowledge. But also, when this information is... Media team, if you could help me with the mic, that's going to work better. I uh, will appreciate it. Um, as we did last week, but before we do that, uh, once again, Sister Gloria, I know we welcomed you, but uh, we want you to feel at home. Uh, feel at church. We are grateful that you could be here. Your family is part of our family, and we are grateful for that. Um, as we did, okay, before we uh, we start moving, my friends who go to Montclair, they're here with us once again. If you could just stand and wave. If you could just stand and wave, and media, let's see whether we can work with these mics. My friends uh, from Montclair, please, please just stand and wave. Come on, church, what do we say? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. We are grateful that you could be here with us. And thank you, Zion family. Amen. Thank you, Zion family. Amen. Amen. Zion family, uh, my friends from Montclair and myself, we know where we were at a certain time. And I just want to extend my gratitude to Zion for the work you are doing. These students, they need us, they are our family, they need us and we need them. And so part, part of our um, you know, service project, there was another day when we had asked you to prepare an extra meal, bring a tray of food, even if it's not your group cooking. These students are not going to come and say, please give me food. It won't happen. But if you give them something, they won't say no. Are we together? Yes. Please, so let's, let's, let's try. Because even you, you remember uh, those days. And that's when we discovered that noodles uh, is, a, is, is, is a complete meal, but now we know that it's not. Uh, let me ask you, before we begin the message today, uh, that we can go and sit together with our families. Uh, if your spouse is here, Find out where they are. Go sit next to them. I don't know whether it is the husband who is going to go where the wife is or the wife is going to go where the husband is. If your parents are here, you're a child. That one is easy. You're the child. You're going to go where your parents are. And um, kindly let us move quickly. Um, even those of us who are helping us in praise team, uh, for now, we are not going to sing. We are going to listen. So please go find where your parents are. Um, do we need all of you in the media booth? All of you? Andrew, do you need all of them? No? You need Sister Londa to come there, right? Yes. So you guys, if you could just come sit somewhere else, maybe one person will remain to help with the slides. Please, can you move? Danny, I see your parents are here. The problem is I know who belongs to which family, so I, I might just start calling names. Sister Bilha, I see Brother Alex is here with the other children, they're here. Let's, let's just move quickly. Gordon, your parents are waiting for you. Ratemo, uh, they're they are over there. Kindly, let us move quickly. Sharon is with Boaz, that's, that's, that's good, as it should be. Uh, yes, Sister Judy, I see you. Um, if your immediate family is not here, go sit next to your extended family. Yes, yes. This should not be an, a, a punishment. <laughs> Sister Liz, good to see you. The 
Brother Cherry, yes, yes. This is not a punishment. It's actually not anything to catch. Brother Warioba and your family, good, 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 good. Wonderful. We are blessed because of your presence. What, what do we say for that family? Amen. Amen. And Vivian and Jerusalem family, wonderful. Uh, yes, Brother Evans with your daughters, I see you. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, yes, yes. Sister Britta, good to see you. Yes, 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 yes. Let's 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 just sit together. This is uh, this message is for us as a family, and I'd like to ask you to, if you are able to take notes, please take notes on today. This will be helpful for you as you take notes, because we are intentional about going to heaven with our families. Amen. Come on, church, we are intentional about going to heaven with our families. Amen? Amen? Because when all is said and done, if we enter those gates of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, and you see Adam and you see Isaac, the fathers of faith, you see the prophets, you see all those people, but you cannot locate your family. And you're asking Jesus, where is my daughter? Where is my son? Where is my wife? Where is my husband? Where are our children? Where are our parents? It's going to be a very, very sad question to ask. But while we still have time now, let us do what we need to do for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Please join me in a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you because you've placed us in families. Lord, we were born in homes. We stayed in those homes because of your choice. You've connected us with loved ones. Because your word has told us that whoever finds a wife finds a good thing. So it is you who has directed those efforts. And Lord, you've even brought us together in this church family. Because your word says that God places the lonely in families. And so here we are today, God, we are asking that we will be a family that pleases you. As we do other things in this world... Lord, we yearn for your commendation. That you can look down and say, there goes a family that pleases me. And here is a family that I am happy about. And I cannot wait for them to come and dwell with me. And therefore, Lord, teach us today. We are not here to hear the voice of a man. We are here to hear the Holy Spirit teaching us. For God, you know that we need you. You know that we need your help. And therefore, thank you, God. Open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our everything, and keep us focused that we can listen to you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. A scripture reading actually ties in with the children's story, and I appreciate you, Peterson, for sharing that children's story, and Aminazi as well, adding on it. This is the background to the children's story, which is, um, you know, we find it in Genesis chapter eight, 19, when Sodom is being destroyed. And as a matter of fact, that story of Sodom and Gomorrah represents another aspect of family, where the angels say to Lot, can you go find out if there are any other members of your family that can be saved together with you? And he goes and speaks to his son-in-law. And they say to him, this is a joke. And so righteous Lot is delivered, but his family is not. What a sad outcome of things. But prior to that, in chapter 18, God goes to visit Abraham. He's on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah, but he passes by the household of Abraham. And Abraham is quick. He does not know who these visitors are. He is quick to entertain them. He prepares food for them. They are able to enjoy a meal. And as they are eating, once they get done eating, there is a prophecy that is given to Sarah. And Sarah is told, by this time next year, you will have a child. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? That is Genesis 18, 14. But are they just about to live? to go to their mission to destroy 
Sodom. I think, Annette, this, this is where you're looking to go. There will be a seat. Let's make a seat. Let's make a seat. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. As they are just about to go to their mission in Sodom, God says this thing, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? God is bothered. He said, there's something that's going on. Abraham is not aware of it. And I don't want to keep him hidden from what's happening. And so God says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? And God is justifying why Abraham is precious in his sight. He says, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. We know that already. That is part of the Abrahamic covenant. We know that already. And so God is not saying, I am favoring Abraham because of the covenant. We know the covenant already. But there's something else God says about Abraham. And this is what he says, for I have known him. He is not pretending. I know him. I know his heart. I know his thoughts. And what does God say? He knows, for I know him in order that he may command his children. God is saying, of all the things I know about Abraham, of all the things that pleases me, is that this man knows how to order not just his children, but his household. But his household. And God continues, he says, that they <laughs> keep the way of the Lord. Not to order them around to pretend that they got it together while they're not. Not to order them around to do what he wants. Not to order them around to do what he himself is incapable of doing. God is saying, Abraham, I know him. I know his heart, I know his thoughts, I know his motives. Of all things about this man, he's able to order, he's able to command, he's able to lead from the front that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. You know, as I was reading that verse and just thinking about it more and more, um, it dawned on me that the fulfillment of the promises of God to Abraham were pegged on how he was dealing with his family. Let me say that again. The fulfillment of the promises of God to Abraham. Because in that passage, there is the covenant, but also God says, this is the trigger. This is what's going to make it happen. This man orders his family, commands his family, leads his family from the front, that they do righteousness and justice and keep the way of the Lord. Sister White has something to say about this. She says, and, and once again, this is something that we studied in my family during one of the evening worship. And we went through this passage because it was a personal challenge for us. Adventist home page 32, Sister White says, one well-ordered, well disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than one someone. Than how many someone? Oh. Come on, church. Than all the sermons that can be preached. One. So when we say, I will go with my family, could it be that God is not even expecting you to stand here and preach? All God is looking for is, can I find a well-ordered, disciplined family? And through that family, 
others will get to know who Jesus is. One. How about if we find two? How about if there are three? How about if there are four? So we have all sermons on one side here and just one well-ordered, well-disciplined family. If you put them on the scales, all the sermons that have been preached by all the people versus one well-disciplined, well-ordered family, this has more weight and is more effective in preaching about Jesus than this side here. She was not confusing herself. She continued, the great evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is what, family? Is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. God knows that. The prophet has revealed that to us. Who else knows about it? Satan knows about it. And so what Satan does, he specializes in making our homes, our families, to be the opposite of well-ordered and well-disciplined. That's what he does, even without us knowing. And so last week we spoke about the issue of time. We do not have time as the immigrant family. We are struggling with time. We are struggling to invest in time. The hassle is real. And so as we are busy doing other things, everything else, what happens instead of our homes being organized and well-ordered, this is one uncomfortable truth. This is a yet another uncomfortable truth that due to a host of factors, our families are disorganized. Because there's no time to organize. Not time to be well ordered, not time to be well disciplined because there's not even no time to see what's going wrong. And everybody is doing everything at any time, anyhow. And then the family becomes disorganized and is heading towards the dysfunctional. You know, the, there's a continuum from disorganized, and all our families are here, by the way. All our families, all of us. The continuum moves from disorganized, and if you're not careful, it ends up in dysfunctional and trauma. And what we're going to talk about today is how some of these things are in our homes, in our families, because they were in our homes and in our families. We inherited them. They are in us, and we are passing them to the next generation. And the plan of God, which is to have a well-ordered, well-disciplined family that pleases him to the point where God says, I cannot hold it to myself any longer. I have to share with Abraham what's going on because I know him. He is organized and his family is organized and he does what he needs to do. And remember Abraham, he was not perfect, guys. He was not perfect. He had his own issues, but he was trying by God's grace. Hallelujah. So looking, I'm going to share with you some of the factors some, or some of the examples. There, there are many examples, but I picked about five or so of dysfunctional families. First thing that you find if there's any addiction in the family. Things that are going to fight against us having a well-ordered family that pleases God is addiction in the family. And sometimes you might just, uh, just say, well, addiction is only just alcohol and drugs. You know, th that's substance, but they also process addiction. There are people who are addicted even to shopping and whatever. And what studies have shown is that when one or more parents abuse drugs or they abuse alcohol or they deal with addiction, it inevitably leads to a chaotic family life. 
Some are addicted even to their phones. Addicted to social media is an addiction. It's anything that is taking time from us and we are using that as a crutch. Actually, in the spiritual world, that one becomes an idol. It leads to disruption of normal family roles and responsibilities. The person is so drunk, they have forgotten to pay the bills. They are so caught in their addiction that sometimes even to drop the kids off to school or to pick them up when they've been dropped by the school bus. They're so stuck that it leads to financial strain. Money is gone. You don't even know where money is. Instead of using the little that God has given to be invested for something, the all that we have is being directed towards addiction. And if there's addiction in the family, dysfunction happens. And there'll be no time, no place whatsoever for well order or organization. The family is heading, it's started from disorganization and is heading toward dysfunction and trauma. There's emotional instability and turmoil. Parents are no longer reliable. They are inconsistent. Children know it. There was a picture I saw of a family that actually had stuck needles in their arms, and they were knocked out in a stupor right there in the car, and the only one who was sober was the little child who was still, uh, you know, uh, in the car seat, strapped in the car seat, could not do anything. Don't tell me that kid is going to grow okay. Because a door has been opened, and addiction has been allowed to come into the home. There's a breakdown in communication. There's a loss of trust. No one can trust. Not just addiction in the family, but a family that is conflict-driven. That there is no discussion that we can have for two or three minutes before it escalates into a fight. Conflict-driven family. Emotional chaos. Emotionally chaotic family. Where nobody trusts each other. Where conversation, like we shared last night, where conversation is devoid of grace, there is no grace whatsoever. High levels of conflict and discord between parents, whether they are married, separated, divorced, can create dysfunction, or rather does create dysfunction in the family. A refusal to communicate with grace Constant arguing, hostility, and unresolved disputes. Constantly. And God is looking to see, can I find one well-ordered, well-organized family that I can use it to speak in behalf of Christianity? But what does he find? A family that's conflict-driven, emotional chaos. Constant. And there are people who are drawn to drama. If drama hasn't happened, then they don't feel okay. As I'm talking to my young people, uh, we meet and we talk, and I tell them, a, a person who is drawn to drama, that's a huge red flag, a huge one. Not just a huge red flag, but maybe it's not their fault. Maybe they came from a family that the only way they could communicate was through drama was through chaos, was through conflict. And a simple lesson, a simple lesson is how can we learn how to communicate with grace might resolve some of these things. Daniel Amen, <coughs> psychiatrist, said children in conflict-oriented families develop stress disorders and they have trouble with attachment. And here you are blaming a child who is moving and jumping from a relation, one relationship to another. They're moving, they're moving, they're jumping, they're here, they're here. And you're failing to ask yourself, what did I do to create an environment where this child 
is driven to stress and stresses every day, they have trouble with attachment. I gotta keep going. So not just addiction in the family or conflict-driven family, but emotionally detached family. These are examples of dysfunctional families. You are physically present, but emotionally absent. Look at that picture. Dad is busy, but dad is home. Dad is not clubbing. Dad is not meeting with other people in meetings, whatever. Dad is pre physically present. Mommy is home. She didn't go anywhere. She's right there at home. Physically present, but emotionally absent. Emotionally detached. And many of you, brothers and sisters, and now <laughs> many of you probably grew up in a home where the parents were present, but they were emotionally absent. Like even just getting a hug from a parent was big news. Even a parent looking you in the eye and saying to you, son, Oh, my daughter, I need you to know that I love you. You know I'm telling the truth. Yes. You know I'm telling the truth. And that's why even today, we have the same problem. Just you, 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 you may not even be able to look at your son in there and say, Son, I need you to know that I love you. Because it's a foreign concept. It's a foreign concept. That the only time when people were being told they were being loved was, you know, in this family, you, all of you are important people, and your mother and I are fond of what you do and keep working hard in school. Emotionally detached family. Uh, dysfunction occurs due to a lack of nurturing, support, and guidance. Parents are physically present but emotionally unavailable. There's a preoccupation with other activities, but there's no investment in time with family. And this is where we are heading, brothers and sisters. Families are heading towards emotional dysfunction because this is where we grew up in. I don't wanna ask the men who are here or the women who are here, how many of you had your dads tell you that they love you? I wanna ask that question. Because if I ask you, then I have to ask your children. But we already know the answer. Daniel Amen says, children in emotionally detached families, they bottle up feelings and they have problems opening up to others. Because their feelings are not important. They are not validated. No one cares for what you feel. And then you come from that household, you come, you meet someone else who came from that household, and the two of you are trying to raise a family when you cannot even open up to each other? And Satan is sitting back somewhere, engineering and orchestrating things. Because his goal is a future generation. Mess up this generation, then mess up the next, and mess up the next one. And we have what's known as intergenerational trauma that keeps going. Children in emotionally detached families struggle with feelings of, un of unworthiness, self-esteem. They have a fear of abandonment. They have problems in school, psychological issues, Issues of identity that we are dealing with, personality disorders. If this was an afternoon program, I would have put some of my friends to the test and we'll, we'll have maybe asked them, what personality disorder, Richard, will come from a person who is struggling with fear of abandonment? As he's thinking about it, Barbara, borderline. Borderline personality disorder. 
And here you are diagnosing people and feeding them medication. They came from an emotionally detached family. They were not sure whether their parents are going to be there for them for the long haul. Authoritarian family. <laughs> I was truly hoping that we will not live stream today, but uh, we are live streaming. Authoritarian family. There is nothing healthy about authoritarian family. You will do what I said because I'm the husband of this home. No, you're not. I'm not going to ask you how many of you grew up in authoritarian homes? Because I already know how many hands are going to go up. But what's even more sad is how many of you are leading authoritarian families and you wonder why our children are turning out the way they are turning out to be. The moment they get that little freedom, they are gone. They are God. Finally, God, thank you for freedom. The sun sets you free. You will be free indeed. I am gone. And you will not see me anymore. I'm gone. Authoritarian family. Parents act like dictators. Making demands, but no positive feedback. Do you know the importance of positive feedback? That was a very good job. You did it very well. I'm happy for you. Do you know what that can do? Not just to a child, even an adult. Thank you so much, my wife. That was a good meal. I enjoyed. She's singing in the church and marching. Now, I'm not saying that's what she does, but I mean, maybe I should speak for myself, right? When she says, that was good. Thank you for what you did for us. Yes, the spirit of God. Positive feedback. For many in authoritarian families, the only feedback was, that's, that's not too bad. You're seen by a son. You can do better next time. And this is real, guys. This is real. Because it is dysfunctional. Rules without relationships. And sometimes we feel so comfortable because that's the environment we've grown in. We bring that environment to our theology and we want to look at God as a dictator. We want to keep rules, 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 but we forget that God is more interested in the relationship. And once you understand and the relationship is good, you will not have a problem with keeping the commandments. You'll have joy actually doing it. And when we fall short, it is not because we are, we, we are sad because we have broken a commandment. We are sad because we have disrupted a relationship and broken the heart of someone who loves us, and that is God. Authoritarian relationship oh, leads to what's even known as performance-driven parenting, where love is the currency. You do good. You're rewarded with love. And you do bad, love is withdrawn. And love is conditional based on your performance. What have you done for me lately? And perfectionist tendencies. Because everything was never good enough. And we pass it on to our children because we also are trying to live our lives vicariously through them. You will do this because that's what is going to bring respectability and honor to our homes. Another thing, the problem with authoritarian families is that it also leads to um, lack of boundaries, invasion of private space. 
lack of individual autonomy and identity, and over-involvement in each other's lives, leading to condependency, stifling of personal growth and development. And Daniel Amen says, children from these homes learn to follow rules, but they do not learn how to be responsible on their own. They grow up with poor self-esteem, they may be prone to anxiety, depression, and substance use due to their inability to control their own behavior because their behavior was always controlled by somebody else. You will do this and do this and do that and do that and failure to which I'm going to have to deal with you. And when they grow up, they do not even know how to emotionally regulate because that was shut down a long time ago. Let me share with you this is the last one that I'm going to share with you. Abuse and domestic violence in the family. And let me say this clearly. If you are here and you're abusing your spouse, I want to give you fair warning. Stop it before you get arrested. And when you get arrested, we are not going to raise any bail for you. And we are not going to come visit you, especially if you are arrested because of abusing any member of your family. I will say amen for you. Amen in the name of Jesus. Even if you don't want to say amen. But in your heart, understand it. If you're being abused, call the cops. Permission from the pulpit, call the cops. I will say amen for you again. Amen. Call the cops. Wacha huyo mzee ashikwe. Lakini siku niliambiwa ni kina mama. Wacha huyo mama afanye nini? And Elder Douglas, we will not laugh at those men. Call. No one, no one deserves to grow up or to live in an abusive environment. No one. No one in the name of Jesus. No one deserves. And abuse is not just physical. It could be verbal. And this is the worst. There are people who will come to church and just a few hours before they have called someone in their family unprintable names. And you're here, you're, you, you, you're singing or you're doing whatever, you should have spiritual mouth cleansing. Verbal, psychological, emotional. And God forbid that there's those who are doing sexual abuse or even the victims of that. That's a dysfunctional family, dysfunctional home. These are homes that are characterized by fear, control, manipulation, resulting in trauma, power imbalances. The study that was done, brain imaging that was done uh, for children who grew up in abusive environment, they tend to have, now listen carefully, they tend to have, this is in the brain, now this is physical, this is in the brain. They have decreased volume in the prefrontal cortex which is an area involved in executive functioning or judgment, impulse control, and follow through. And here you are sometimes, you know, you're quick to judge someone who is having problems with impulse control, but you don't understand what, what was going on in their household. Instead of judgment and criticism, maybe they need help. The, the brain imaging showed that Children who grew up in an abusive environment, they tend to have a smaller hippocampus, an area of the brain involved in learning and memory. Find someone struggling in school, can't seem to recall anything. Let's check what's going on in the house. Also showed that the brain has reduced volume in the cerebellum, an area involved in coordinating physical movements and thought. They also showed excessive activity in the amygdala, the brain fear centers, and many people are growing up struggling with anxiety disorders. The amygdala is overly active, has 
being conditioned to be overly active. Because of growing up in an abusive household, you do not even know what's going to happen the next minute. Because someone is just about to raise hell. I shared with you last week that a picture is worth a thousand words. I want to share with you this picture. I want to let that sink in for a minute. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. The father is here. And he's putting scars on his little child, son or daughter. Putting scars on his little son or daughter, or child rather. But what we also see is that he has the same scars. And this dysfunction continues generation after generation. I'm not aware of it. I didn't handle it. And so I've passed it on to my children. They're not aware of it. They didn't handle it. And now my grandchildren also. But what I also didn't know is that I got it. I've also been in a family where that was the, the norm. But they also got it from somewhere else. A picture is worth a thousand words. Generational trauma can be passed down from one generation to the next. So the next time you hear it runs in the family, you ought to declare that it stops with me. Someone say amen. amen. It's going to stop with me. It stops here and it ends with us. So just look at your family, the one you're sitting with, and just say to them, affirm it, it stops here. It stops with me and you, it ends with us. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. What steps can I take to have a well-ordered, healthy, and functional family? that is pleasing to God. What steps can I take? I just want to share with you three things. We'll come to a close. We'll come back in the afternoon and get in depth in this. What steps? First, by the grace of God, be intentional about establishing godly order in your household. Someone say amen. amen. By the grace of God, be intentional. Is your family organized? How are you managing expectation? No one has to guess what they need to do where. Who is responsible for what? Which parent, which spouse is responsible for what? What are the kids supposed to be doing and when and where? Do the children know what they're supposed to do? What is your responsibility as a father? What is your responsibility as a mother? God is saying, I know Abraham. His house is organized. And that is why Abraham, even though he had to deal with some family drama, at the end of the day, listen to me carefully. Even though he had to end with, with, a, with a polygamous family, when the time came, Ishmael and the mom had to go, but he gave Ishmael an inheritance. Are we together? There was order. There was organization. So good was it that at the time of his burial, Ishmael and Isaac came together to bury their dad. God says, I know him. We cannot, we refuse by the grace of God to let our families live by remote control. Let there be order. God says, he says to let every Thing. Let all things be done decently and in order. There should be some form of order, organization, some form of discipline. You should be able to know on some very basic, how much do you spend as a family in a month? That is basic. Basic. 
Who is responsible for this? That is basic. There should be some form of order, organization, some form of discipline. And when the children are also disciplined, I don't know, it's only in this country, but growing up, your parents' bedroom was a no-go zone. Was it not? What happened to us? What happened to us? What happened to us? And then there's role confusion. At some point, you don't know who is the parent and who is the child. Role, total role confusion. Oh, can we do this? <laughs> we, we, are, we are not able to do it because uh, Babu or, and, and the person who has been called Babu, Babu, uh, Daddy, Kamama, Kamami has said we can't. W what do you mean? You know, my, my, my son or my daughter is my best friend. What can we do? Let everything the Bible says be done. This There should be, as a parent, be a parent in the name of Jesus. Amen. God has your back. Or if I say this, they will hate me forever. Take the chance. Take the chance. If they'll hate you because you are ordering your family according to biblical standards, take the chance. And when they grow old, the Bible says, they will not forget what you are raising them to be. Take the chance. Parents, take the chance. If I take away that phone, he will throw a tantrum. If he throws a tantrum, make sure you miss it. What's the big deal? Please come back in the afternoon. We're going to have more practical examples on this. But here is another one. Resolve to find help in recognizing your own hurts, your own trauma, your own dysfunctions, and when you find, you, once you resolve to do so, follow through. What did you inherit from your family of origin? If you are to be honest with yourself, which I hope you are, of those five family dysfunctions, how many dysfunctions could you identify from your family of origin? Some will find two, some three, some will all five. And others will even add, say, there's another one that you need to add, maybe after this we need to talk about it. But how much of that are we passing on in our own households? Getting help Getting counseling, going for therapy is not a sin. It is not breaking the commandments. Find help in recognizing your own hearts, your own trauma. Don't just say, oh, what, what, what did not break me, uh, made me stronger. It's in you and you're passing on to the rest of us. By the grace of God, it can be fixed, it can be handled, so that this ends with us, the next generation, will find the joy of growing up in a well-ordered, well-disciplined family in the name of Jesus. Someone say amen. amen. But as we do also, let us rely on God to order our lives and then order our families. God has to be given access. Because brothers and sisters, God is the one who heals. There are some issues that all they need to do is to be exposed to the blood of Jesus. Someone say amen. amen. And God is able to handle this, but he has to be given access. He has to be allowed. We rely on God as we meet together in family worship. We rely on God as we pray through these issues. Just last week, this week that's ending today, we pleaded with you as part of the prayer focus, take one day of the week to pray and to fast for a member of your family.
or for your family in general. I'm not going to ask how many of you did it because you know in your heart. But if Christ is not given access, how are we going to handle those issues? In as much as you're getting therapy and getting counseling and getting help, they need to be exposed to the name of Jesus. Someone say amen. amen. And by the grace of God, his goal, his plan of having one well-ordered family will be realized. I want to finish by saying this. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed be, uh, in him? For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him. How many of you together with me say, by the grace of God, we are going to restore order in our homes? How many of you say, by the grace of God, I'm going to look for help to understand the issues that I'm dealing with so I don't spread them to the next generation? How many of you are willing to give God access? Say, I give you access to my life, to my household. I will do the little that I can. And God, you make up for the deficit with your grace. Father, in the name of Jesus, look at those outstretched arms. Lord, we need you. We need you. Some of us can identify with all the five dysfunctional families. Some of us may be one or two, but all of us need your help. If for no other reason, God, we don't want to sit back and say, well, I, I came from a perfect family, but then here we are. When we are sleeping and relaxing, the devil enters. And instead of being those who will break the cycle, we'll be the ones who are going to start the cycle. Lord, have mercy on us. We lean on your grace. That, Lord, you are able to make up for the deficit with your grace. But we also ask that you give us the strength, the willingness, the wisdom to do the little that we can. The little that we can. So you can make it up for us. It's our prayer, God. It's our desire to enter the gates of New Jerusalem together with our families. Together with Maranatha Church family. It's my prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, thank you so much, Pastor. We thank God for the wonderful time that we have had listening to this wonderful teaching, reminding us when uh, the Bible is about to close in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, God puts these words, blessed are they that do. We've been told what to do. We have... Uh, been reminded over and over again how we should put our lives in order, how we should put our families in order. I don't know how many people tried even one of the precepts that we learned last Sabbath. Blessed are they that do. I think there's a lot of points which Pastor put through, but the most uh, implicable one which touched me is that we have to let God order our families. Every day when you wake up in the morning, tell God to order your family. He's the one who knows where your children will be for the rest of the day. He's the one who knows who they will be associating to. Let's pray that God order our families. At this time, I'd like to invite the choir, the youth choir, to give us a song.
Sana somari Charumeta Vikipigwa Angukeni Uisi judie ni Sana muili Owe kwa na mfame Mishaeli Na ya zaria Hanania Thank you, thank you so much, Yotu Choir, for that uh, item. Uh, we're going to be ushered out, but uh, before we do, uh, those parents whose children are going to the Kamburi, when the others are leaving out, please come to the front here. There is a quick meeting for you. The parents whose children are going to the Kamburi, please, we're having a meeting right here in the front. I'm going to ask if we may stand up so we can pray together. <laughs> 